Our speaker today is Reverend Dr. Norma Edwards. Now, Norma is a near-death experiencer. We've had many near-death experiences here, and they all have a fascinating story to tell. They all report having greater spiritual insights and understanding than they had before the experience. But not all of them fully apply their newfound wisdom when they return. Norma does. Norma Edwards is a recognized expert at merging spiritual principles into clinical practice. She's a near-death experiencer living out her purpose on this planet. And those purposes include founder and director of Reprogram Your Life, as a certified NLP life coach, her work on the planet has impacted the lives of hundreds of clients. In her role as director of Reprogram Your Life, she has provided services to a number of federal educational institutions, including James Madison University, Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency, the Department of Health and Human Service in Washington, D.C., jail, and families and schools together located in Wisconsin. And Dr. Edwards is an experienced public speaker, which will soon be quite evident. Please welcome Dr. Norma Edwards. Thank you for such a wonderful welcome. Whenever I read, I hear that bio being read, I wonder who they're talking about. <laughs> I brought it down to I'm just a little black woman trying to make a living on earth. <laughs> I am normal. For a number of years, I had no idea what that meant. It took three continents, eight spiritual teachers, living in seven different countries, two marriages, five children, eight grandchildren, and 20 years of my life for me to acknowledge what it meant by the three little words, I am normal. It was a cold December morning when I rolled out of bed in London, feeling not very well, but since I had been home on a month's sick leave and the doctors didn't seem to know what was wrong with me, I figured if I didn't get out of bed and try to make it to work, I might lose my job. So I made my way to work very slowly that day, and as the day progressed, I was in a lot of pain. And just about four o'clock, I looked at the clock, and it occurred to me that what I was experiencing was labor pains. Of course, since the doctors had told me I couldn't have any more children, even the doctor didn't look for a pregnancy. He was absolutely sure about his, his pronouncement that there was no more babies coming out to normal. I stepped into the elevator, and I want you to Pay attention to this, because this is one of the major pieces of this experience. I stepped into the elevator, and there was a beautiful uh, lady dressed in Indian sari with a dot on the top of the head. She was the only person in the elevator. I stepped into the elevator, the door closed, and I collapsed. And um, when the doors opened, of course, she ran out, and since we were just two blocks away from the hospital, they didn't bother to call an ambulance. She grabbed a cab and, and got very you know, people to help her. They got me into this cab and they got me to uh, the hospital down the road. Now, when we got to the hospital, I just about regained consciousness and I have a thing against um, stretchers and ambulances. So I said, no, no stretcher, we're walking in. Well, the two of them kind of held me on both sides, and as I got to the emergency room, I collapsed. The cab driver, being very concerned, did not realize that he drove away with my handbag in his car. So here I am now, I am unconscious, and this poor child doesn't even know my name. 
And you say, what is her name? I don't know. Where does she work? Where does she live? I don't know. Do you have a telephone number? I don't know. She was just a stranger in an elevator. Well, God bless her soul that night, that Hindu woman stayed at that hospital because they had to call the cops, you see, take a picture of me, to try to find who I was and where to find my husband. And that took several hours and she stayed. She strayed through the fact that um, eventually I became semi-conscious and the doctor says to me, you have a baby that's dead inside of you for several weeks and you need to have surgery. And at that point I said to him, too much pain, just, just let me go, just let me go. The next thing I experience is I'm on the ceiling and I'm looking down on my body on this operating table. And it's kind of interesting, up until then I'd never seen the inside of an operating table. See, I'd just come from a country that didn't have television. And I'm amazed at the number of people and, and, and the way they're moving around, you know, the nurses, the doctors, and, and I'm up in the ceiling and I'm like, wow, but, but, but how can I be in two places at the same time? Uh, and then the doctor picked up the instrument and I looked at it and I thought, hell no, he's not going to cut me open. How do I get off the ceiling? Listen to the story very well. I'm processing clearer than I would if I was conscious in a, a dramatic situation. How do I get off the ceiling? Well, I'm here to tell you, you know those teachers that tell you that your thoughts turn into words and your words turn into energy that creates action, believe it. Now, soon I said, how do I get off of this ceiling? In front of the doctor. And I'm going, hello, hello, this is me. You know, you don't need to do this. Whatever it is you want to do, hello. I, I don't understand. He's not paying any attention to me. So something in my head says, try the females. Females are more intuitive, you know. So I'm running from nurse to nurse, explaining, I'm normal, please don't do this. But Nobody seems to be able to recognize and that I'm there. And so the next thing I know, all hell breaks loose in the operating room, my flood line. And I'm looking at the graph and I'm going, wait a minute, these people seem to be crazy. Now the instruments in the operating room is not working because you could not explain to me in any kind of way that I could have just died. But I'm processing, and I'm aware of everything that's going on. Um, so then the doctor picks up the, 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 you know, the thing that they use to shock you back. And because I was in spirit, I could see the corona of electricity around me. And I'm hell no. If I'm not about to die, I'm not going to stay here and allow them to put that level of electricity on me. How do I get out of here? And no sooner I said those words, I found myself through the ceiling and into a dark tunnel. Now when I say to you it was a dark tunnel, I don't think you can begin to understand that level of darkness. It was darkness that seeped deep into your soul. And I'm in this absolutely dark tunnel wondering, well, where is this going to lead to when a speck of light appears? And it begins to oscillate. And of course, if you're in a very dark space and light appears, your eyes get drawn to the light. So I'm drawn to the light and I'm watching this oscillating light. And with each, each time it goes around, it expands. And, um, and then I come to the, I'm moving almost at the speed of light. And then I come to, I can see the entrance or the exit of the tunnel. And the thought in my head is, if I ever recover from this experience, if I entered that velocity of light, it would burn the Cornelius out of my eyes. And I merged. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, there are no words in any language to explain the joy, the bliss, the glory, the love. In that moment when you merge with light, 
It's the most awesome experience. And the only way I can describe it is that piece of scripture speaks about joy unspeakable and full of glory. Today I spend a lot of time helping people to transition from hospices. And what I bring is, ah, oh, you're about to experience the joy of light and love. So I merge with the light and I'm feeling absolutely amazing and exhilarating and, and I'm aware of this light that I've become a part of the light. And then the thought again says, well, how do you move about in this environment? And instantly I'm moving again. And now I come to what may have looked like a Roman, you know the Romans built those big pavilions with those pillars? And in those days, you know, televisions were this big and they were cumbersome. I obviously had never seen um, a full screen, but the screen was probably as big as the length from here to here. And the screen appeared, and when it appeared, it began to scroll. And the screen was divided into three columns. The column on the left was my life the way I had written it. Don't let anybody tell you God writes your life for you. Oh, no, 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 no. He may have input. The left-hand side was my life as I had planned it. In the middle of the screen were all the conditions that came to me in this life in order to be able to fulfill what is on the left. And that's where I started laughing. It was really quite funny. I'm like, how could I have been so stupid? What was wrong with me? <laughs> because when I look at what I had said, <clears throat> and I looked at what I had done with the conditions to help me accomplish it, I was in my way. And I'm here to tell you today, get out your way. And your way is full of all the things you want. One of the first things that I observed between these two parts of the screen was the fact that um, God gave me free will. And I'm wondering why in the world, in all of his wisdom, did he do that? <laughs> because you see, one of the things I discovered is I knew how to pray. I grew up in a family where both grandparents had churches, so uh, they taught me how to pray real well, you see, but they didn't tell me anything about meditation. So I'm looking at the screen and I'm seeing the conditions that are intended to give me experiences that will help me to change. And I'm watching myself on my knees before Almighty God like a beggar, please, please, please take it away, it's too hard. And I'm thinking, what was wrong with me? And then this will that we have, but what I really want is to go down to the shop that sells ice cream and eat a whole lot of ice cream so that I can get my attention away from what I have to do. And believe it or not, we do have this free will to a certain extent. So I watch the many ways I put obstacles in the way of my learning and in the way of my transition from one place to the other. And then the next thing I observed was, the next thing I got very upset by observing these two columns was that um, despite the fact that nobody taught me, they taught me one side of prayer and didn't teach me meditation, so I had no hope of being able to act. You see, when we pray, I saw it in the record, when we pray, as soon as you pray, you create a stream of energy that goes out into the universe. And as soon as it gets out into the universe, that stream of energy gets reversed with the energy you need to change the situation or to change yourself. Now, when we are walking around blocked up with I can't, I can't forgive Mary Sue, and I can't forget what John Doe did to me. I gotta hold on to this. What are we doing? We're clogging. That's what I saw in the record. We're clogging the heart. The heart is now clogged with junk. So I'm watching this, and I'm watching myself on my knees making these prayers, take this away, take this away. And I can see the energy coming back at me, but when the energy got here, because here is blocked, 
the energy did this. It broke up into several pieces. And anybody who was standing on the sidelines halfway open received my blessing. Because I was too blunt to be able to contain or hold or use the energy that is sent to me. And you can imagine, I'm standing there like, oh my God, they never told me this in church. <laughs> so then my attention got caught with the third column. And the third column looked as though someone had designed a stamp that said, objective not accomplished. So on the whole of the far end of the screen, it's just objective not accomplished, objective not accomplished. Now I'm really feeling like a fool. One of the things I also noticed in the scrolling was I was always a very empathic, child. I grew up in Guyana, South America, where there was a tremendous amount of poverty. My father was a teacher, and if you're a teacher in a community where most people are illiterate, they treat you like you're Jesus Christ itself, you know? So we lived among farmers, etc. And my father would do things for them, like write letters for them, you know, fill up their forms, teach their children, and when they got crops, they would bring the crops so we lived well, but for all of my life, I have lived with the feeling that I did not deserve to be able to eat every day when there were children around me who couldn't. And so my mother would make my little lunch for me to take to school, and I think I started fasting very early. I would give it to children who I knew when they got home didn't have anything to eat and I'd figure, well, at least I'll be hungry until I get home. Well, I'm looking at all of this in the record, and one of the things I recognize there, which is a lesson I want to give to you is, you can't get paid twice. You know, it's like you go to work and they tell you they'll pay you, what, $25,000 a year? You don't get, there's no way you can get them. Thank you. There's no way you can get them to, um, to double it. While we live in the world, we do have to exchange what we have, energy and labor, right, for money. And that's quite okay. But your blessings come from the places where you don't get paid. Because once you've done whatever you've done in the world and they've paid you, you've already received your payment. The blessings come from those things which you're not paid. So. We come to the end of the screen and I have a lot of questions. And the screen re-scrolls again, and only now, they have dropped seven lifetimes in there. So I can see why I don't understand so much of what's going on in my life. And one of the first things I noticed was, my husband at the time, the marriage was having, I've been married twice, the marriage was having some problems. And one of the first things I noticed is that we had three lifetimes that we had lived together, and I was the one causing the problems, not him. So in the lifetime I was in, it was my turn, right? Pay karma. And, and that created a whole different dynamic on how I looked, how I looked and I observed my marriage. So when the screen was over the, for the uh, second time, I asked the question again, well, well how do you move around it? in this life. And um, it took me to the river. Yes, there's a river. We used to sing it. There's a river. Yes, we will gather at the river. Beautiful, beautiful river. There was a river. And on the other side of the river, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Some of them I could recognize because I had lived with them in the life I just left. But most of them I couldn't recognize by their future, but I could recognize them by their love. The love. I could feel the connection of love that held us together. And then my aunt stepped forward, who was um, someone I really dearly loved. And she looked at me and she says, you can't stay. And I said, why? She says, no, you, you have to go back. And I said, why? And she says, you have to go back and tell them there's more to life than meets the eye. And I said, but there are millions of people back there. You can give that message to one of them. Why do I have to go back? And I said, no, you can't stay. You have to go back. 
And then I found myself falling, 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 falling. And the next experience I had was moving from this brilliant light, love and joy into excruciating pain in my body. And within the next 24 hours, I realized that I had been changed. I can look at the nurses and doctors around me and I was kind of amused. Well, they're trying to heal people, but they're totally unaware that they got medical problems of their own. Because I can now see aura, you see, and I can see what ails them, etc., etc. And I'm listening to people's opinions and I'm like, where in the world did they get that idea? And then I'd stop and ask myself, but wait a minute, Norma, yesterday you believed that too. How come you don't believe it now? See? Going through a near-death experience is a paradigm shift. You shifted from where you are, and 90% of what we walk around thinking we believe is really what was told to us. And it doesn't really matter whether it's some, a lot of it is real, it's true, but it's not our belief until we've experienced it. So the universe sends you these experiences so you can make what you're walking with and you're, you're holding on to, can make it your own belief. Does that make sense? So then they slammed me back and they sent me back and now all hell broke loose. I was really, really very aware. If I opened my mouth and said half the things that I could see, they would put me in a mental institution. Thank God for that. I was very aware of that because I ran into someone recently who opened his mouth right there in the hospital and started talking and he did end up in a mental institution for a while because they thought he was crazy. So the life now changed, three years of depression, uh, three attempts at suicide, because I don't want to be here. And after the third attempt, uh, which was kind of very interesting, the voice in my head said, well, A, if you come back, we're going to send you back. So stop trying to get here illegally. And then I said, well, is there a legal way to do this? How can I do this legally? Oh, he says, I've only got five more minutes. <laughs> so the next thing I know was, um, I'm, um, the power of intention. How many people here have read that book? Power of intention. It's a powerful book. Go back and read it. Oh. <laughs> Go back and read it simply because it's true. We set goals and objectives in life. That's what I saw on the record. But quite frankly, what we need to start with is our intention. What is it that you intend? And when you're sure about your intention, then you can set the goals and objectives. Because we're running around setting all these goals and objectives with no real intention behind them. And hence the reason why they don't manifest themselves. So I found myself setting the intention that I will Return to the light, even if it is just for one moment, one day, or one night. And I created that as a mantra. And I kept that mantra going. It took 20 years for that to manifest. But what it did was it drew the spiritual teachers that I needed into my life. What I found very interesting about the eight spiritual teachers into my life, none of them ever asked for payment. And uh, the first one was a pastor, you know, Anglican church. He taught me about sacredness, hence the reason why I said I kicked my shoes off before I said on this holy ground. He taught me about sacredness. And then it's like the, the relationship lasted for about six months. We worshiped there, etc. And then I moved on, and the next um, body of teachers was a husband and wife. He was 90, she was 83. And, and I went to him, and by that time, we had returned back to our homeland. And I said to him, I feel, anybody here ever remember the song by Neil Diamond, I Am, I Said, to no one there, Lord, have mercy, thou woke me up. And no one heard at all, not even a chair, I'm trapped between two oceans, that's how I felt. Uh, everything that we'd asked God for in that marriage had materialized. Life was wonderful, you didn't have to worry about a checkbook. But I felt like, excuse the expression, a piece of shit. And so I, I show up with this 90-year-old man who's considered an elderman, a wisdom keeper on the planet, and I say, who am I? And he says, um, well, first you got to know what your birthright is. I said, birthright? Nobody in church ever told me about my birthright. And so he said, your birthright is love. And I have this feeling you've experienced it on this trip that you took. 
And first you have to embrace your birthright. And you have to begin to live like you understand it. Phenomenal teaching between he and his wife. It took him three years to take me to the Old Testament. Yes, that Bible in your hand has got all the information you need. But let me let you into a secret. What I saw on the record is we took a PhD level book and we put it in the hands of kindergartners to explain. And so all they're doing is telling us the stories. But Christ walked on water. Wasn't that wonderful? But they have no clue how to help you to get there and do that. That requires spiritual discipline. So these eight teachers framed. You're welcome to keep talking. I know we only have 30 minutes, but your talk is so good. We'd love to have you keep, keep going. Thank you so much. Don't feel rushed. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so um, he took three years to take me to the Old Testament. I did not realize that in the Old Testament, are links or gateways to the New Testament. And that was his job, to teach me that. And then when he was finished, he turned me over to his wife, who took me through the Psalms and the New Testament. And you see that meditation that you just went through? <laughs> Absolutely real. Absolutely real. Um, I began to see Judas in a different light. I don't know about you, but I expect when I get through the gates of glory, Judas will be there to welcome me because if there was no Judas, I'd have no redemption. It's one of those things like we, we sitting in our reality, there are things we don't want to do because they don't seem as loving and as what have you. But let me tell you, your enemies are the people who love you the most. I saw that in the record. I saw one particular person at work who was just driving me insane. And when I looked at it in the record, we traveled three lifetimes together. And he had become convinced that I was never going to learn this lesson with love. So he took on the role as the enemy in my life. And boy, did he push. And when I looked in the record, what I saw was he was giving me the mirror image of what it is that I had to work on in myself. So we went through these teachers, and, and unfortunately, like the, the husband and wife, they became so close to me. Three years later, she looks me in the eye and she says, it's time for you to get out of here. We've taught you everything we can, now you have to go live it. Now you have to go teach it to somebody else, and you've got to work it. Uh, we left there and we came to the United States of America. That's a whole long story. But I won't go into that. We came to the United States of America, supposedly, to um, educate our children. We wanted our children to get higher education. Uh, but when we got here, I'm still, I'm still searching. I'm, I'm still seeking. And now I'm beginning to realize that they showed me my purpose at the record. And the record, incidentally, is the Akashic record. I didn't know about the word Akashic record until I started reading Buddhism. Um, they, they, they show, I knew that they showed it to me, but I couldn't, it's the only part of it I couldn't remember. And now I understand why. Everybody's looking for their purpose, but until you start the work to give you the skills and the ability to manifest it, it you're never gonna know it. So it's not about asking the question and waiting for an answer. It's about asking the question and asking yourself, what is it in me that needs to be worked on and where do I find a teacher that can help me to do this? Because, if you don't remember anything else about this talk, imagine if I arrived in, in Jamaica. In Jamaica, mostly they used 240 volts of power, except for the hotels where they anticipate that we need 120. I could not take a piece of equipment that is designed with 120 um, and plug it into a 240 channel. What do you think would happen? That's what some of us are trying to do. I want to know my purpose and I want to know it now. But I'm functioning at 100 watts and my purpose requires 240. So until you raise the vibration, I tell people, I don't teach people how to be 
I, I'm not going to teach you how to heal. I'm not going to teach you how to do past life regression. What I'm going to teach you is how can you raise your vibration? You see, the only difference between Christ and us is that his vibration was off the page. So he could override the natural laws of the universe. You ever go to Walmart and the, the cashier make a mistake? And then she has to raise her hand and the supervisor has to come along and override what she's put in. Have you ever experienced that? Well, that's what's going on with us, you see. We have to raise the vibration until we're vibrating at a level. And I'm going to hit you with this one. I said it yesterday, but I don't think people really got it. Um, the world is now moving, the world is now moving, for those who are ready to move with it, to the place where we're gonna stop wasting land to bury dead bodies. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it never occurred to us before, we can recycle the body that we have. We have the ability to decide, you see for me, I had to keep coming back, that's what I saw already, I keep coming back because I kept leaving one lifetime and not finishing. And, and they let you leave, but they force you back in the body so that you finish what you said. And well, in the future what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing is that we'll be able to decide, okay, I'm, I'm 77 right now, this body is breaking down. I need a better vehicle. So I can then make a decision to go up there and do some research, talk to some people, and um, leave my body for maybe two or three years while it gets regenerated and come back down and save the body and carry on the job, you see? Or I may choose I don't want to come back into this body and choose somebody else's. Which means that we won't have to go through the process of going into the womb, getting trapped in there, got to crawl out of there. Are you feeling me? Gotta learn how to walk, to talk, and all this drama. We'll just instantly be able to move body to body so that I can accomplish what I need to accomplish and leave. And that is going to require of us some amazing spiritual work. That is going to require of us that we have got to become disciplined. You know, one of the biggest complaints that people, the souls on the other side who come to work with us complain about, when it's not pretty. You, you get rid of the trash in your house, right? You would not invite me to your house and invite me to stay in the bathroom, sleep in the bathroom, and not clean the trash, would you? But they expect us to come work with them. The body is a living temple, and they do not take care of dumping the trash. Can you feel me? Can anybody feel what I'm saying? You've got to have two bowel movements a day if you really want to be spiritual. You have to drink a certain amount of water to wash all that stuff away because you're asking high-level beings High level energy to come in and function in your body when you got all that waste sitting there. This is one of the biggest complaints. When they get a chance to, to connect with those of us on this side who can speak with them, that's one of the biggest complaints. Would you please ask them to keep get rid of the trash? We'll be a whole lot more comfortable. Put more water. Water is to spirit what oxygen is to us here on earth. Okay. I hope I've given you some food for thought, but I'll leave you with this one. 20 years after I made that intention to return, the universe allowed me to do that. And what it was that allowed me to do that was rhythm and sound. It took the sound vibration for a very interesting human being in my, in my life who was really a stranger, but the tones of his voice had what was necessary. And the piece of music, how many people here have ever heard the piano in D? Acabell's piano. And if you listen to it, the version by George Winston, that's the one that took me out. It took me all the way out to the 16th dimension and back. 
And for me, whenever I go out, I go back to the Akashic Record because there are things that I need to learn. And I'm working sometimes with people and I need to know what is the shortest route to get that vibration very high. So it is possible for each and every one of us, you don't have to die. Very soon you're not going to have to die to experience a near-death experience. If you do the work that you need to do and you clear the space, Christ said you cannot put new wine into old skins. You gotta get rid of the old skins. You gotta open up this heart chakra into love. And then we will find that we can function as the multi-dimensional beings we are. I'm just gonna do one quick one. Person sitting here, you have had 144 lifetimes. During that time, you have lived every single tradition, every single personality, and you're getting ready to end these lifetimes, because when you leave, you will not return to Earth. When you leave, you will go live on the 16th dimension, and that is heaven. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your interest. I wish we had more time for questions and answers. But I will be speaking at Edgar Casey this afternoon, and there will be chance for questions and answers. I hope you learn or found something. There is nothing to fear but fear itself. I got my kids scared to death because I said to them, if God said to me tomorrow, you see that train that's going to take you home, I will throw a celebration because I know where I'm going.